from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon and uh, welcome uh, to the first and inaugural scholarly program panel discussion. I see a lot of familiar faces that know me, but uh, for those that I haven't had the privilege of knowing, I am Rubens Medina, the Law Librarian of Congress. And um, it is indeed a privilege, and I thank you for showing the interest to come and share with us what I believe to be a very interesting learning moment here in the Law Library of Congress. We may consider this a historical moment since we are in this new facility of the Law Library for the first time. And also, we are launching what we, these panel discussions as a series under the scholarly program. So you may expect to be invited again to another session or sessions of the same format and on topics in the public interest. We are offering to you today a discussion on torture, detainees, and the US military. We believe that is indeed a topic in the public interest. As a moderator of this event is one of our scholars in residence. In fact, our only scholar in residence this time. <laughs> he is going to be the one promoting the program, hopefully, for the days to come. And he is Professor Gary Solis. Uh, he is in the Law Library, as, a, as I mentioned before, as a scholar in residence, and is a retired Marine with 26 years service. After tours of duty in Vietnam as an armor officer, he attended law school at the University of California at Davis and was a judge advocate for 18 years. His master's of laws in criminal law is from George Washington University Law School. His PhD in the law of war is from the London School of Economics and Political Science, where he taught for several years. He is a recently retired United States Military Academy professor of law, where he headed the Military Academy's Law of War program. He is also an adjunct professor of law at the Georgetown University Law Center, where he teaches the law of war. I am not going to stay here, as I said, very long. I, Gary is in charge. So therefore, Gary, please take over and introduce our distinguished Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Gents, ladies, uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I would like to introduce our panelists. To my left, Brigadier General Patrick Finnegan, United States Army. He's the academic dean of the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. Before becoming dean, he was professor and head of West Point's Department of Law. In 1971, after graduating from West Point, General Finnegan earned a Master's of Public Administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He served in various infantry and intelligence billets before he received his law degree from the University of Virginia Law School, where he was an editor of the Law Review and Order of the Coif. He was an instructor at the Army's Judge Advocate General School, and five times he was the senior legal advisor, the staff judge advocate, of major Army commands. In 1991, he served in the Persian Gulf in Operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and he was the staff judge advocate of the U.S. Special Operations Command, where he was the staff judge advocate, and later he was the staff judge advocate of the European Command during the Bosnian conflict, before he returned to West Point in 1998. Mr. Lee Casey is a prominent partner in a prominent Washington law firm of Baker and Hostetler. Concentrating on federal constitutional and international issues, he's a frequent contributor to the editorial pages of the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and other publications. Along with political commentary, he has authored numerous law review articles. He's a former law clerk to Judge Alec Kaczynski, and in the 1990s, during the Reagan era, Mr. Casey served in the Department of Justice in its Office of Legal Counsel, advising the Attorney General and the White House on issues of constitutional and statutory interpretation. 
In DOJ's Office of Legal Policy, he concentrated on U.S. strategic legal issues. Additionally, for several years, he was the Department of Energy's Associate General Counsel. Mr. Casey, we appreciate your willingness to join us on short notice, and it's a pleasure to have you here. <coughs> to Mr. Casey's left is Ms. Jackie Northam, Northam a Canadian-born news reporter and analyst, currently National Public Radio's national security correspondent, covering foreign affairs, defense, and intelligence policies, uh, and terrorism, among other topics. She's regularly heard on NPR's Morning Edition and All Things Considered. Since 2003, she's regularly traveled to Guantanamo Bay, <coughs> Cuba, reporting on the military detention center and on military commissions. She was NPR's lead reporter on the Abu Ghraib abuse scandal and the administration's policies on torture and the Geneva Conventions. While based in Kenya, she covered the Rwanda genocide and uprisings in Burundi and Tanzania. When stationed in Budapest, she covered the fall of the Berlin Wall and events in the former Soviet Union. In Phnom Penh, she reported the disarming of the Khmer Rouge and uprisings in Thailand. In London, she reported on the European Union. She's the recipient of three Edward R. Murrow Awards and several Associated Press Awards. And on your far right, Brigadier General James C. Walker is the Marine Corps senior military lawyer. He's the staff judge advocate to the Commandant of the Marine Corps and director of the Marine Corps Judge Advocate Division. General Walker graduated from Clemson with honors, was commissioned a Lieutenant of Marines in 1979 when he gained his law degree at the University of South Carolina with honors. First in his class at Naval Justice School, he then served in Beaufort, South Carolina as a prosecutor and then a defense counsel. He was transferred to Marine Corps headquarters in Washington. He later earned his Master of Laws degree with honors from Georgetown University Law Center and a second Master of Laws degree at the Army's Judge Advocate General School. He served on Okinawa at El Toro, California and is a Naval War College distinguished graduate. He was a legal advisor to the U.S. European Command during the Bosnian conflict. He's twice been a battalion commander, rare for a lawyer. Our procedure is to have each of the panelists speak for 10 minutes uninterrupted, and then there will be some crosstalk for about 20 minutes, and then there will be questions from the audience for as long as uh, it takes. Gary, I would also like to remind everybody, especially the speakers, this has been recorded. So please be mindful of that, <laughs> and that uh, we use the mics, and the cameras are rolling. I should also say that all of the speakers speak for themselves, not necessarily for their organizations, their armed branch, or their law firms. Uh, General Walker. OK, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the hospitality, especially one of the first groups in the new building here. Uh, always. Interesting to hear your introductions. What Professor Solis forgot to say is, I guess, if, if you want to know where my problems really began, it was almost 25 years ago today when I reported to work for then Lieutenant Colonel Solis. So, uh, <laughs> besides my formal education, I've had some informal education that may have contributed to my warped views. Uh, but it, this is a stimulating topic, how we treat detainees. I think many of the discussion that we hear always focuses on the pure legal aspects. Certainly there's legal doctrine here that we can talk about for hours, but I think the one aspect of the discussion that isn't focused on as much is how we treat detainees and what that means to the military. I'd like to talk about that a little bit in my time as well as the pure legal. And that's really speaking just as a Marine. It's a discussion that could be the same for any military member. So what does the way we as U.S. forces treat detainees, how does that impact a military serviceman? The first is really just the basic concept of reciprocity. How we treat others does impact how our forces are treated today and will be treated in the future. It sets the example. Now, we're not saying that in reciprocity, in international law, there's always going to be perfect reciprocity. But we do know from past practice that you set the example and you set the standard. So how would I want to be treated as a Marine if I were detained? Or if you bring it to a more personal level, if you're not in the service, how would you want your son or daughter to be treated if they were detained? 
And so that's more than not a theoretical discussion. Sometimes I'm afraid we get caught up on the theoretical end of the discussions, talking about legal nuances between Common Article III, the Geneva Convention, the Convention Against Torture, and various other doctrines, and we forget that there is that real practical effect. Because what we do, or what we authorize others to do, sets that standard for the future. Again, how would we want to be treated if we were in the military or your sons and daughters were? And you can bring that to just some simple examples. What would the United States think? How would we react if U.S. service persons were treated in certain ways? And we can take one of the most controversial enhanced interrogation techniques, I think is the, the term now, the one that's been in the, certainly coverage the most, the waterboarding, the simulated drowning. Now that's kind of a, a legal discussion we hear about in the press, we read about it, but what would be the reaction of you or perhaps the rest of the American public if we saw a U.S. military member who had been detained by foreign country or individuals and was subject to that technique? Would we be having any discussion even about whether that technique was lethal, legal, lawful, or compliance with the law of war in some fashion? Now that's the legal part of the discussion. The practical again for the military is we know that how we treat others will impact in the future how we're treated. It hasn't been perfect in reciprocity, but when you look at past conflicts, certainly there has been, to a large degree, compliance with the law of war, and certainly some adherence to it, if not total compliance. The second area from a military where how we treat detainees is important is how it impacts our operations overseas, the domestic and international support for U.S. forces. How can we accomplish our mission in the future and how this affects that? A lot depends on respect and support. In U.S. operations overseas particularly, we're going to generally operate in coalition operations. If you look in the history, probably for the last 20 years, there have been virtually no unilateral U.S. only operations. It's always been a coalition operation of some form. So our ability to attract coalition partners depends at least to some degree on the degree of respect and cooperation that we have from our allies. So I think how we treat detainees can impact on our ability to have coalition partners in the future. The second aspect of military operations that can be impacted is how we get there. We like to think as, the, as America, with the large military we have, that we can go and do what we want, but largely we depend on international cooperation. We still need overflight rights. We still need port rights. We still need access to facilities. And our ability as a military to operate overseas depends on those. And I think our respect and how we're held and viewed in the international community impacts on how we're able to get things, just simple port visits. Already, for example, there are certain places where we are unable to have port visits because, for example, a nuclear policy. We can't take the ships into port. So that could impact on how we treat detainees and the way that we work there. The third area that really impacts military operations is the cooperation and support from the local population around the world. Um, I think the history has shown that we're certainly trending more toward low intensity conflict, counterinsurgency operations, things like that in the future. A big aspect of success in those is the respect and the cooperation of the local population. I think as we treat detainees, the way we treat detainees can ultimately also have some impact on that type of cooperation that we will get in future conflicts around the world. The final perspective I've off I would offer really as a Marine, and probably more just as any service person is, I think how we treat detainees and as we fight the global war on terrorism, we still have to uphold the foundations and values of our nation. Uh, for over 230 years, we've had certain values. We've upheld those values. And generally, in times of different opinions, we've held what I would call the high moral road. We've done what's right. 
sometimes that wasn't what was the easiest course of action. Often it wasn't what was the most expedient course of action, but we've held that moral high road and set a standard for the world. And I think that's very important. That's something our nation stands for. That's something our military, and certainly in my perspective as a Marine, that's something the Marine Corps stands for. So the discussion on how we treat detainees carries over into a lot of these other areas besides the pure legal discussion. The pure legal discussion is stimulating in an academic sense. There's numerous treaty nuances and how, how do we get where we are today. Uh, many of the discussions began, I participated in some in a former capacity back in 2002 when we were trying to determine what would be the appropriate interrogation techniques. I think the two key points of those discussions really come down to this. One, what's the standard going to be? Do your interrogation techniques or standards, how you treat detainees, do they differ because of the importance of the issue? Do the standards differ because these individuals might have information that could prevent future loss of life? Or is there a constant standard for the interrogation of detainees? Lots of discussion has gone on since 2002 in this area. And in the end, we really, the policy in DOD today, which is probably the good point to end with, is that in the Department of Defense, on torture it's clear. We don't condone, we don't participate in torture. The position of the Department of Defense is that we comply with international law, we comply with common Article Three in all our dealings with detainees. It's important we do that. Again, I state that international law has not always worked perfectly in the past, and perhaps it needs some modification to deal with changes in the world situations, but the position of the Department of Defense is that we comply with all of detainee operations, we comply with Common Article 3. That's the way we're trained. It worked in Korea, it worked in Vietnam, it worked in Gulf War One, and I think it can also work in the future in the global war on terrorism. And then the final point again is that we have to, as we fight the global war on terrorism, still defend our nation but uphold those values that really have set our nation apart. Thank you. Jackie Northam. All right. Well, my, um, my introduction to Gary Solis and our whole relationship has been torture right from the get-go. <laughs> I'm not 100% I'm not sure what that means or says. Um, I just want to back up a little bit. I, when I went into Iraq the first time, it was two days after Baghdad fell. And at that point, you could travel throughout the whole country. Um, and I did. It was good. Basra, Najaf, Tikrit, Mosul, everywhere we wanted to go. And one of the areas I went to was uh, Sadr City. And at that point, again, it was very fresh after, you know, the city had fallen. And um, the people in the mosque where I went were, had gathered a lot of stuff. They'd gone out to the sports arenas where they had been used as torture chambers, that type of thing. And they were bringing hauling stuff into the mosque. And that's where I saw something, I guess you call it an Iron Maiden. And it's the first time I'd ever seen sort of an instrument of torture. And not long after that, we went to another building. It was a couple of days later, and it was where they had kept all the documents of people who had simply disappeared. And they ranged from little children up to old folks and that. And in the bottom floor of that building, um, I guess it's called a stretching rack. It was the table where somebody would lie, and they would actually pull the people apart. Again, it was these are things I had never seen before in my life. And to me, this always instituted, in my mind, what was torture. Um, pulling out fingernails, as they do now in Iraq. They drill into people's heads, everything. I mean, it's, it's hideous. And it was only after Abu Ghraib happened that I realized there's many other types of forms of torture that never leave a mark. Um, and it's things that I never thought would actually constitute torture. For example, um, uh, very loud music for extended periods of time, bright lights for extended periods of time. I was a teenager. I liked loud rock music. What was the problem here? You know? But it, only in my reporting did I finally find out that it, it creates a sensory overload. It absolutely can melt down all your senses. It's a form of torture. Um, and it, it was one that apparently that the U.S. was buying into. And it's all a sense of degree, too. If it was a little bit fine, if it was eight hours, 16 hours, forcing people to keep awake and that, people would become compliant. There was no question about it. When Abu Ghraib broke, um, there was a couple things that happened. And, and one of them was it, it just sort of split open this whole nut. And very, one of the first things that became apparent is, is that a very small group of people had taken our standards, U.S. standards, international standards for what are torture, what's inhumane, what's cruel treatment, and reinterpreted, rewrote 
a lot of these laws, and they did it quietly to the point where even if senior administration figures they felt would not buy into this, what they were trying to do here, they were kept out of the loop. And the only reason that became apparent is because of Abu Ghraib. We did not know about this at the beginning. Um, there were many other things. There were people started talking about, okay, how do we um, treat people that we've detained? It became an open conversation here. What staggered me was is that there wasn't this massive outcry amongst the pub public that these rules and regulations, international standards, long-standing formulations were being challenged and been done so quietly. The population, the people really didn't cry out. They were upset. And I often wondered if we had not seen the pictures of Abu Ghraib, whether a lot of people would have cared what was happening. Because as always, it's the pictures that make all the difference. Think of the Ethiopia famine years ago. People had gone in there and written about that. Radio people had gone in there and um, uh, broadcasted. But it was only when you got the first pictures out of Ethiopia that the world reacted. And I often wonder if that's the same thing that we saw at Abu Ghraib. The other thing Abu Ghraib did is it shone this spotlight from Iraq all the way across the world at Arct, and it landed at Guantanamo Bay. And obvious questions became clear. <laughs> if we're doing this to them over there, what the heck are we doing to these people who are behind uh, you know, well, they're actually not behind closed doors. They're actually very open doors. They're behind cages, essentially, there. And that we don't have, there isn't any transparency there whatsoever. All this, all these things became relevant. I remember the first time that I went to Guantanamo Bay and I interviewed Major General um, Jeffrey Miller, who unfortunately in my reporting, I busted him down to Major Jeffrey Miller. <laughs> I guess that's really not a good thing, but anyway. Um, and I remember just doing an interview with him and him saying, no course of interrogations, no stress techniques. And I thought, that's interesting because I didn't ask about that. These were new terms to me. And as things became clear, what was happening in Guantanamo Bay is, is that there were coercive techniques being used and there were stress positions, but I didn't understand what these terms were. I hadn't asked about them. And so it always had it rather struck me as odd. We know now that uh, General Miller went over to Iraq just before the Abu Ghraib um, uh, uh, detention problem became clear, and he, w he was brought in to help um, clarify, help get better information out of people. It was shortly after he brought, he said, look, the Geneva Conventions don't apply to us at Guantanamo Bay, but this is how we do it there. Okay, I'll just leave that with you. And he left. It was shortly after that that the abuse started there. Um, <laughs> sorry, I've lost my idea. <laughs> but anyway, so you, you always had this problem with Guantanamo as well. And the only way that we ever got information out of what was happening in Guantanamo really was, um, first of all, detainees coming out saying that they had been tortured. And we had problems believing them because the first set that came <coughs> out and said that they actually sold their stories. And so we all just backed off saying, if you're going to sell your stories, you're making things up as you go along. Mm -hmm. Freedom of information requests. The Associated Press started issuing all these uh, freedom of information requests. It took two lawsuits. We finally started getting information about who was in there, what was happening. What was interesting is we saw the FBI. All this stuff came back redacted, just all blacked out. And then all of a sudden we started seeing the FBI wasn't blacking out their stuff. And they were saying things like, well, uh, we, we asked them that we did not want to do this harsh interrogation technique, techniques. They were asking the CIA, this type of thing. So we started piece by piece getting a sense of what was happening there, and it wasn't good. What's interesting, though, is under the next commander of Guantanamo, Major General Jay Hood, it's now evident that a lot of that was cleaned up to the point now where the International Committee of the Red Cross and Human Rights Watch both say it is a clean shop down at Guantanamo. Now, it depends how you define torture because a lot of people will say that open-ended detentions without any sense of uh, you know, what, what a detainee's future holds or what happens day to day, that is in its own sense a form of torture. Just a couple of things because I'm getting the, um, the sign here. The, a couple of things that are going to happen that are still pending out there. And one of them is with the CIA. Um, there have been uh, the two federal court orders that CIA hand over documents about any of their role at Guantanamo Bay, how they um, interrogate, whether it's robust, whether it's aggressive, whether it's downright illegal. The CIA has not handed any of that over. When the Military Commissions Act <coughs> was rewritten in, or written in November, um, they were supposed to come up with a list of how 
what their procedures are. We understand that the CIA is now holding back on its t interrogation techniques because they don't know what is legal and what is not legal at this point. And I understand from a friend of mine, a JAG, that we're just waiting now for President Bush to sign off on an executive order, really outlining what is legal and what is not legal. The other thing that is we have to take a wait and see attitude is when and if these commissions fully get up and running, how the, um, the issue of torture will be handled during those court trials, whether it will be classified material, whether it will be kept out. We don't know. We have to see that. The only other thing that I want to bring up before I finish here is, is that I think we have to be very, very careful with this whole term, torture. Um, because I've been covering this now for about four years, and what's happened is the term abuse or mistreatment, while very, very serious, is always sort of intermingled now with the word torture. It's a very fine line sometimes, but it is a definite line between mistreatment and abuse and torture. There are distinct differences, and I think we as journalists somehow, we don't challenge um, defense lawyers who um, tell us their, their client has been tortured and everything else like that. I think we have to be very, very careful. It's, it's, it's like genocide. If we use it too much, we dilute its impact. We, we cheapen it somehow, and I think we do have to be careful. Thanks, Jackie. Mr. Casey. <coughs> um, well, let me uh, uh, begin by uh, uh, pointing out that how this issue is addressed depends very much on where you sit in the government and what your responsibilities are. And as, as Gary said, I'm, I'm not purporting to talk on behalf of anybody uh, other than myself. But it seems to me that the debate uh, has to take place in the context of understanding that we are in the midst of what may be a unique conflict, a conflict certainly of the type that we have not seen in, in many centuries, where the principal target of our enemy is not our armed forces. God knows our armed forces are a target. We're among the first targets uh, that they, that they uh, uh, went at in the 1990s. But their principal target is, in fact, the civilian population both here in the United States uh, and elsewhere uh, in the West. Now, the civilian population uh, has a right to be protected. I think that this tends in these discussions, uh, which tend to, to focus very much on, on the rights of the detainees and such, tend to uh, forget that, that the civilian population has a right to be protected. Indeed, uh, one might well say that with respect to the military, um, they do take some risks. I mean, it is understood that, that when you enter the military, uh, you take some risks. Um, the civilian population is required to take no risk. Uh, they're entitled to be protected. Now, in a conflict like this, the only way they can be protected is through the gathering of intelligence. You have to know uh, what the enemy is planning to do so you can be there first or you can somehow uh, otherwise interrupt it. Uh, there are a lot of different ways of getting this intelligence. Virtually all of them are controversial. Uh, virtually all of them have been objected to by one or more segments of the population. They're intrusive, they're unfair, uh, but uh, let me tell you, uh, uh, as someone who has been on the inside, not during a, a, an armed conflict, but uh, has been involved in discussions with respect to law enforcement, there is no magic wand. The administration is not holding out. There is no uh, means that they can guarantee uh, the safety of the civilian population that doesn't involve uh, intrusive and often very nasty methods. Uh, and I think, you know, it is a perfectly reasonable position to come up and say, look, uh, we believe in these values so much and we will not compromise them, and if that means that more civilians have to die, we accept that and we hope that you will agree with us that that is okay. Um, unfortunately, that's not usually how it, how it, is, how it is phrased. Uh, and when we look at the question of is, you know, torture permissible, uh, I think it has to be looked at in that context. I think it also, we have to be very careful with the definition of torture. I mean, uh, obviously, everyone always talks about, uh, uh, about torture. Um, almost no one wants to actually sit down and start discussing what is torture. There is a legal definition of torture. 
Uh, it is, you know, the imposition of, of severe pain uh, and suffering. Uh, there's a slightly more definitive definition for, for, for uh, mental torture. But, but that's about it. And, you know, this, this frankly, you know, the, the idea that there were a secret group of people uh, in the Justice Department, uh, partially in my old office, in the Office of Legal Counsel, that were reinterpreting the law. The law had never been interpreted. I mean, the, the, there was um, uh, a large amount of materials out there, uh, conferences, years, of course, of, of the development of, of uh, uh, human rights law and international humanitarian law, uh, lots of claims made about what it meant, uh, and lots of people had a lot of understandings, but about what it meant. But uh, certainly uh, the, the war on terror brought the first requests uh, for serious legal opinions about what does this mean. So I, I don't know that it was a question of people, you know, rewriting the rules. Uh, it's a question of people uh, working their way through and, and actually formulating the rules uh, in a way that could actually be used uh, in, a, in an ongoing conflict. Uh, in terms of, you know, how we move beyond simply the, the generalized, well, what is, you know, torture, severe pain and suffering? Well, you know, I would agree uh, that torture uh, is illegal uh, and that it is almost never uh, justified. I can certainly think of situations where I would think it were justified. Unfortunately, they're all mostly uh, movie scripts. Uh, you are almost never going to get to a situation where you have an individual who you know knows what you need to know, uh, uh, where, uh, where in order to protect innocent people uh, you might well feel justified uh, in using genu genuine torture, the rack, for instance. Uh, uh, as you introduce doubt into the situation, of course, your justification, both under the doctrine of necessity, under the law, as well as your moral justification, it seems to me, does indeed uh, diminish. Uh, and there is a whole lot of doubt in virtually all of these situations. Uh, and so the question becomes, okay, what, what can we do to force these people to cooperate with us, to tell us what they know, keeping in mind that unlike the honorable soldiers of sovereign states, they have no right to keep their military secrets. They have no allegiance that we must respect. Uh, we are entitled to try to force them to cooperate with us. They're not entitled to prisoner of war status under the Geneva Conventions. Uh, prisoners of war, frankly, uh, um, uh, cannot be coerced in any way. Indeed, if you actually read the, the language of, of the treaty, uh, the, the military manuals that, that we have been using, I think, are not, not in compliance. Uh, the, the language is actually, they cannot be subjected to unpleasant or disadvantageous treatment. Basically, you can ask them pleasant or politely whether they will cooperate, and, and that's about it. Um, these guys don't get that right. They do have some rights, though. They have to be treated humanely. They can't be subjected to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. Again, the question is, what is that? What does that mean? There is no particularly good definition uh, of that <coughs> treatment out there. Um, does that mean that you cannot force someone to stand for four hours? Uh, is that torture? I mean, if you think that is torture, you've never worked retail. Uh, um, you know, I mentioned that to someone once. He said, yeah, but you weren't standing there naked. And the answer was, yeah, no, that's true. I wasn't standing there naked. But on the other hand, they may be naked, but they don't have uh, you know, 60 screaming uh, shoppers pulling at them. Um, uh, obviously, it is always a matter of degree. To make someone stand there for four hours is not torture, nor is it cruel, uh, inhuman, or degrading treatment. To make them stand there for 24 hours, th that's different. Uh, and so uh, it becomes, if you are going to define uh, as anything that is coercive as torture, then basically, there can be no interrogations. Interrogations are inherently coercive. Uh, that is why in the criminal law, uh, you have a right to have a lawyer present at questioning uh, because it is coercive. That's why in the civil side uh, of the law, uh, people like me sp spend a lot of time and money uh, defending depositions because, you know, in part we want to do what we call protect the record, make objections and such, but in fact we're there to protect our clients so that if the other lawyer gets aggressive, we get aggressive. Um, can turn into a, you know, like a couple of, uh, a, a couple of bull moose uh, uh, going at each other. Uh, in interrogations are, are coercive. So if you're going to define coercion uh, as the standard, then 
no interrogations, and accept that that means innocent people are going to die. I mean, that's the cost here. That this is not a cost-free equation. Um, and uh, uh, let me actually, uh, there are a couple points I, I did want to respond to with respect to the reciprocity. And uh, um, we, have, we have signed on, complied with the Geneva Conventions for 60 years, three generations. Uh, in that time, not a single one of our opponents, none of our enemies, have complied with the convention. We have never gotten the benefit of the bargain. Uh, you know, perhaps someday we, we will find a, a, an opponent who will. Um, uh, I suspect uh, that, um, uh, that since our enemies ordinarily understand that we will not treat them as they treat us, uh, they get a free ticket. There really isn't reciprocity. Uh, and that, you know, I think that is actually an, an, important, uh, an important point because by making clear that we will adhere to these rules regardless of what anybody else does, in fact, we do endanger uh, our people uh, because they cannot expect uh, better treatment uh, from people who, who frankly don't share our values. And I'll stop there. Thank you. General Finnegan. Thank you, <laughs> Gary. <clears throat> when Gary asked me to come, he told me that he had been designated as the best scholar in residence here at the Library of Congress. <laughs> I didn't realize at the time he was the only scholar in residence at the library. Um, and, and as Jim Walker said, there's a connection here too. Jim and I actually worked together in Europe, uh, and Gary and I worked together at West Point. And I wanted to tell you, and Doctor, I know you gave a little bit of introduction, but I just want to tell you one or two more things about Gary Solis. Um, Although he got his Ph.D. from the London School of Economics in Law of War and did a great job over there, he actually gained more fame in London because he was a commentator on the O.J. Simpson trial at the time that it was going. <laughs> I'll, I'll get you for this. <laughs> uh, for the record. <laughs> That's right. I'm on television, too. And to say that Gary was involved with the Law of War program at West Point is uh, is accurate but not nearly enough. In fact, Gary invented the Law of War course that we teach and really oversee, oversaw the, the entire Law of War program that all cadets take. He's been a keynote speaker at the Law and Terrorism Conference that we've run for five years since 9-11. He was a visiting professor at West Point for two years after he had been a, a professor there. We brought him back to be a visiting professor. And he has also been named an honorary member of the Association of Graduates at West Point. He's not a West Point graduate, but he's an honorary member of that association because of the great things he's done for cadets in West Point. So I just want to tell you that about Gary. Now, you're not counting that on my time, are you, Gary? That's true. I'm thankful that you did ask me to come, Gary. I'm interested in this topic and have been for a number of years. And uh, let me just tell you that my bottom line up front is that torture is neither legal nor practical nor effective and we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, reciprocity concerns aside or anything else, it, it is, first of all, it's not legal. It's not legal for us to do it when you, if it's torture. Uh, under the scheme of international law, we seem to forget that, that we have signed up to this scheme of international law. In the Geneva Conventions, which is the most ratified treaty in the history of the world, we are one of 194 nations who've signed up to this. So when we talk about this administration or Congress and this administration redefining what torture is or redefining what our obligations are, they might define it for the United States, but they don't define it for the rest of the world. And we have signed up to this treaty. We are members of the Geneva Conventions, and 193 other countries can prosecute our people for engaging in torture, even if we have hamstrung ourselves by saying we're not going to prosecute us because. Those conventions say that any country who signs up to those treaties can and, in fact, has an obligation to prosecute those who violate the treaties. So if we are engaging in acts of torture, then we are putting ourselves at risk in the international community, uh, just from, from a legal point of view. Where do you stop? If you think torture is okay, in some circumstances, who draws that line? You talked about that a little bit, Mr. Casey, and, and I'm not sure how you draw that line. Uh, when some soldier on the other side has information that may help your troops, I mean, you've captured somebody, are you going to torture him because it may save some individuals there? 
I don't think so. I hope not. Um, Jim talked a little bit about reciprocity. And if you think reciprocity doesn't work, all you have to do is compare the, the treatment of U.S. prisoners of war in Germany and Japan during World War II. The Japanese didn't really follow any of the rules very much, and they, they tortured our prisoners and, and mistreated them very much. And many atrocities occurred over there by U.S. forces as well because of the way the sides were treating each other. Not nearly the same thing in Germany. The, the death rate among prisoners of war in the, in the Pacific theater is much higher than in the European theater because of the way the sides treated each other. I think there's another part of international law that you've got to think about, or not international law, but it's the goodwill of the international community. Because we are part of this scheme of international law and scheme of human rights, if you think about where our country was on September the 12th, 2001, headlines in the newspapers in France were, we are all Americans. And where are we today in the standing in the international community? And much of that results from incidents like Abu Ghraib and what we've done. And it goes back to what Jim said about what kind of a nation are we going to be? What kind of rules are we going to follow? What kind of beliefs do we have? We say, when we went to Iraq, we went to Afghanistan, we say we're the good guys. We say we're going over there to export the rule of law, to bring the values of democracy over there. You can't do that if you're abusing people. You can't do it if you're torturing people. In fact, it, it works against you because you look like hypocrites. You say one thing and you do another. And it's certainly been our experience in the Middle East that that's what's going on. We have probably created more terrorists and more enemies by the way that we have behaved at Guantanamo Bay and other places as well. And I just I want to say one other point. Torture is not effective. It doesn't work. You can talk to any experienced military interrogator or FBI interrogator and they will tell you it doesn't work. And it probably doesn't work even more with this enemy we're facing now who are fanatical, who believe in things. And you hear about this ticking bomb scenario. We're just going to do this in this ticking bomb scenario because the nuclear bomb is going to go off and we've got to get this information in the next two hours or Los Angeles is going to explode. Do you think that person doesn't know that all he has to do is hold out for two hours and that he's probably just going to give you misinformation as well? It doesn't work. And there have been experiences in history that show it doesn't work. The French tortured Algerian terrorists. What's the result of that war in the long run? The Israelis changed their, their law and their approach to say we would allow moderate physical pressure to be used. Again, straying away from torture, we're going to do moderate physical pressure. It didn't work because they said they would only do it in a ticking bomb scenario. And they kept sliding down that slope because what happened was they were only going to do it to the terrorists they caught in a ticking bomb scenario. And then the moderate physical pressure became a little bit more severe physical pressure. And then they said, well, we don't just Maybe we, it's not going to work if we just do it with this terrorist because we can't find him right now. But we've got his family members here. And so maybe we'll use a little moderate physical pressure against them. Has it worked against the terrorists, against the Israelis? I don't think even Israel would tell you that it has. And in fact, the Israeli Supreme Court has said, that's it. No more moderate physical pressure. This is not effective. It simply doesn't work. And to use <coughs> one of the things Jackie said, at Guantanamo, whatever you call it, enhanced interrogation techniques or moderate physical pressure, it's clear that we broke the rules in the beginning. We were doing enhanced interrogation techniques. And however it's defined, and I'll tell you, it's been defined for more than 50 or 60 years by people who've written about the Geneva Conventions, not just in the Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice. We, vote, we broke the rules. Did we get any actionable intelligence? No. Now, if you go down to Guantanamo, they will show you the interrogation rooms they use, and they'll talk about the interrogation techniques that they use. And what works is getting on their side, getting them to talk to you. Over time, it takes time, but they have gotten actionable intelligence at Guantanamo over the last several months, not by torture, 
but by a system of rewards when they give information and by getting to befriend them in a way, they're never going to be friends. That's the kind of thing that works. To me, <coughs> Condoleezza Rice said, this is not America's war on terror. This is the world's war on terror. I think she's right. But we can't go it alone. That's what we have tried to do, both in fighting the wars and in trying to reinterpret some of these standards. We are not going to be effective in this battle if we do that. It may be that this is a new kind of enemy, someone whom we haven't confronted before, someone who needs new rules and new ways to, to do that. But it's not up to us as one nation of 194 who've signed up to this international scheme to decide that on our own. Do you want Libya, North Korea, Iran, name your country, to come up with their own interpretations of these laws? If we think there are new laws that need to be written or new approaches that need to be taken, then we should be the leader in bringing the international community together to figure this out. I'll close with one thought, and that is we have the most powerful, the most effective, the strongest military in the history of the world. But it's also clear that force alone is not enough. And the use of torture is simply another means of saying, hey, here's the way we're just going to use force. Force is a good thing to do, because we'll force this intelligence out of them. We'll force them to tell us about things. It doesn't work, and it degrades us as a nation. Thank you, gents, ladies. I have a brief question for General Walker and General Finnegan, uh, and I'll ask uh, General Walker to respond first, and then General Finnegan, and then uh, Ms. Northam and Mr. Casey, if you have anything to add. Uh, General Finnegan, you spoke of hypocrisy. No Abu Ghraib officer has been tried. Colonel Pappas, the OIC, the officer in charge, received a letter of reprimand and a fine and was given immunity. Lieutenant Colonel Jordan, who was in charge of the interrogation process, has been charged, but years later remains untried. That sounds like hypocrisy on the part of the U.S. Army and the American government in my book. Now, General Walker, uh, the repeated war crimes against Iraqis committed by Marines, Iraqi detainees and civilians suggest problems with the moral high road of which you spoke. Is there pious pronouncements on one hand and a Marine Corps reality on the ground on the other hand? Well, the counterinsurgency fight that we're engaged in Iraq is a very difficult fight. It's an up-close, a personal fight. And in any fight, whether it's on television with pugilists or in a war, you first set the rules. Not every blow struck in the fight will be totally lawful, but there are sanctions when you violate the rules. But you have to have those rules to begin the fight to judge the basic conduct. And I think that really works in a situation like this. There have been cases that are currently at litigation literally today as we speak in the Marine Corps for Marines who violated these standards that we set. Uh, when we find that one, we've investigated and we're holding them accountable in the courts. We'll never have every degree of accountability, but the rules still need to be there, Gary, because you have to set those rules but in a, in, a, in a war, and it is a war, one that's covered very widely, it is a close-up counterinsurgency fight, uh, there have been some violations and we'll investigate those. General Finnegan? A wise man once said to me, it's not a surprise that there are violations of the law of war, it's a wonder that it's followed it at all. And there are going to be violations. It is uh, young people with weapons, with adrenaline up with their friends being killed uh, and sometimes there are violations but we do prosecute violations of the law of war one of the things that mr casey said is that sometimes our opponents have not followed these rules and he's right but we follow them we we follow our obligations to prosecute people under the geneva conventions we prosecute our own soldiers and our marines do we do it perfectly no not at all the i would say 
on the question of Abu Ghraib, the people who were prosecuted deserved to be prosecuted. There is no doubt about it. Whatever guidance they got or interpreted beyond what the normal rules are, they clearly exceeded it and took delight in what they were doing. Uh, they were simply, I don't think the, the pictures we saw were any sort of scheme to gather intelligence. They were simply means to embarrass and, and humiliate the prisoners that they had, many of whom had nothing to do with terrorist activities whatsoever. Should there be more accountability for senior officers? Probably so. Uh, it's, a, it's a dilemma that the military justice system faces a lot of the time. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jordan is scheduled to be prosecuted. He will be court-martialed. There have been some administrative sanctions and administrative and loss of rank, uh, loss of opportunities for some of the senior officers involved. That's not the same thing as going to jail. I don't think that they did the same kinds of things that the, the soldiers who did it. Uh, but if you want to talk accountability, I think it might even go higher than military officers. Actually, I, I travel to the Middle East quite a lot and, 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 and keep in touch with it. And I'm afraid with Abu Ghraib because it was such a high-profile case. And again, you had the pictures. You can't get away from those pictures at all, you know, beamed around the world. Um, and anybody can tell you in the Mideast that justice has not been done here. I think there was a real call um, in many parts of the world that people have got off scot-free. And I think I understand that there are some <coughs> cases where it's just going to be that way. You know, you can't get around it. That some people have been pulled in and that. But I think with Abu Ghraib, because it was such a stain on the military, who other and these I covered Charles Grain Charles Grainer's um, mm -hmm. trial, his court martial. And frankly, personally, he's a thug, you know, and he was put into the situation where he could get away with what he wanted to do. But it has created such a mark on the U.S. military, which it shouldn't. And I think in this one case, because of the U.S. reputation, it would make a big difference if higher, higher people were pulled in. Nothing further, Mr. Casey? Uh, no. All right. Uh, uh, Mr. Casey, uh, you said that uh, adhering to the rules harms U.S. interests, is that correct? You said that we're entitled to force civilians to reveal information. Are you, in effect, condoning torture? Um, well, no, I don't think I am. First of all, I don't recall saying that we had a right to force civilians to do anything. Uh, we're talking here about enemy combatants, people who are fighters, uh, uh, engaged in a, in a legally cognizable armed conflict against us. Um, I don't condone torture. I don't think we, we, we should use it. I'm not sure why the effectiveness issue matters that much, frankly. Uh, either it is legal or it isn't legal. Whether it's effective is not relevant to that issue, even though effectiveness seems to take up a large amount of the discussion in, in these uh, things. Um, whether it's effective, I don't know. I've never done it. I've never had it done to me. But I will say that um, I doubt whether torture was a regular part of the judicial processes as well as the political processes of virtually every state for about 4,000 years uh, because it didn't work. Um, I think in many ways saying it doesn't work helps to justify uh, not facing the hard question of, of, of you know, uh, should we actually uh, uh, consider it in certain circumstances. Um, you know, in, in terms of uh, uh, whether we should use torture, fine, let's not use torture. Let's say torture is off the board. But what's torture? I mean, does that mean we can't yell at them? Does that mean we can't hold them without a criminal trial? I mean, is it torture to keep someone in jail for the rest of their life? Now, if it is in fact torture to hold someone in hopelessness, I'm not sure why a life sentence isn't just as tortuous. I mean, you've had due process uh, in a criminal court, but does that make a difference? I mean, you're still looking at the rest of your life in prison. I mean, if that's torture, then it's torture. Um, and, you know, so I, I, as to uh, uh, whether um, uh, there are, you know, instances when, whether torture uh, has, you know, can be justified, um, uh, frankly, I am more worried about what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis. And yeah, I know, I, I, I've, uh, you know, I've heard people say different things. I've heard people say we've gotten act actionable intelligence for from using uh, stressful methods, and I've heard some say that we haven't. But I, you know, in addition, the, the sort of, well, okay, if you do it through the methods we're now using, it takes time, but we get there. Well, that's great, um, but what if you need it now? I mean, you know, what if you're the president and, you know, the Joint Chiefs come in and say, well, we're working on it. What is that? What good is that? 
I mean, you know, and of course we have the best military in the world, the most expensive, I'll grant you that. Where were they on September 11th? Why weren't there a dozen aircraft carriers in New York Harbor? I mean, the answer, of course, is they had no idea there was going to be an attack. They didn't have the intelligence. Um, uh, that is why, you know, this debate is important. It's because uh, uh, the, the uh, need to obtain the intelligence is so critical because otherwise, um, frankly, uh, it's not clear what we have what we have the military for. Well, uh, Ms. North, can, uh, can I respond to that? Just certainly. For a moment? Uh, first of all, I hope you're not blaming the, the military for the intelligence failures before the September 11th. Uh, the military acts on the intelligence that is gathered by intelligence agencies and provided to them through the national security apparatus. Yeah, I, do, and, I do indeed blame the CIA, but go ahead. Okay. Well, and you know, there, all you have to do is look at the September 11th report to realize that there were warnings that attacks were coming, that, that the president was told an attack by Al Qaeda is imminent in the United States. Uh, and for whatever reasons, they didn't take the action, the, the, those levels of government. It isn't the military who had anything to do with that. If they had taken some action and said, an attack is imminent, put 12 carriers in New York Harbor, there would have been 12 carriers in New York Harbor. So it, it, I, I'm not sure how we connect the intelligence failures of the CIA and others to both gather the right intelligence and then to implement it correctly at the feet of the military. I'm just not going to accept that. Well, Ms. Northam, uh, I, I, if I understood <laughs> things correctly, uh, Mr. Casey said that uh, there's little difference between holding someone under a life sentence adjudicated by a court and holding someone, period. Uh, Ali Almari has been held in the Charleston, South Carolina brig, a military facility, since December of 2001. <clears throat> Five and a half years without charges. The first 16 months, he didn't have a lawyer, he didn't have a visitor. Now, do you see a difference between Almari and someone who's obvious question, and someone who's been adjudicated through a court. And do you report on those things? Well, Almari, oh, look, at they've arrived. Um, <laughs> Almari is not, it's a national um, issue, and so I, don't, I do the foreign, which would, and that's a little dispute if uh, Guantanamo's foreign or not, as we all know. But nonetheless, um, whether they're adjudicated or not, I think yes. Um, I'm not a, I'm not 100% sure that um, being held indefinitely is a form of torture. I think it's a complete injustice. There's no question about that. But there are defense lawyers that will certainly say that is a form of torture. Um, should I wait a few minutes? Why don't we take a minute here? Yeah. Another question for you, Ms. Northam. Uh, <laughs> Jackie. <laughs> Jackie it is. Okay. Uh, there is a poll that was taken a year ago that indicated it was a, an AP Ipsos survey that indicated that 61% of Americans support the use of torture in the war on terror. 61 refused to percent refused to rule, rule it out. About one in 10, 11% said it could be justified often. Uh, do you have have you had experience in dealing with the public in which torture is an accepted? Technique for I mean, that's what I was saying in the sort of preamble earlier. Is I was always really surprised when Abu Ghraib happened, how there wasn't this huge outcry about this sort of stuff that was happening. And, and also Guantanamo, um, the, the bigger outrage seems to be beyond America's borders than within America's borders. And I think it comes down to 9-11 once again. I think because we got hit here in America that I think we are probably more apt to say, do whatever you need to do to make sure it does not <coughs> happen again. And I think, I am not surprised by those figures whatsoever. Just on our earlier question though, we were talking about Guantanamo and holding people indefinitely and everything else like that. I think in many ways this is, <coughs> this is, is it creates as big a tarnish against America's image as does the use of torture. Um, I covered the second last trial that I was down there in Guantanamo was for David Hicks and he was an Australian. He was the only person that's actually been fully tried at Guantanamo and then released. At the end of the day he's been considered the, what? Oh, there's, it's, there, you know, these have been considered the worst of the worst 
and yet he got a nine-month sentence, which is akin to sort of a drunk driving conviction, something like that. And it was very interesting because the people in Australia, I went to Australia just after that, and the people in Australia weren't sympathetic towards David Hicks at all. There was this huge groundswell to get him out of Guantanamo. It's not because they liked him or they cared about him. It's because it suddenly dawned on people that the, you know, their baby, when David, you know, their child who was a baby when David Hicks went into Guantanamo <coughs> was now going into kindergarten and he's still held there. So it was a sense of due process that was withheld. And I think that's the problem with Guantanamo is it's created a huge stain. It's not because we want to let go of terrorists, just get rid of the people who that, who are there that shouldn't be there and that type of thing. So that was just the answer to the earlier question. I just wanted to get that across. I think holding them isn't necessarily a sense of torture. That's my <coughs> personal thing. But I think it is an injustice because we've let 400 go who all of a sudden <coughs> aren't a threat. You know? so. uh, General Walker, uh, recently the Marine Corps has charged uh, Lieutenant Colonel Shasani, the uh, commanding officer, the battalion commander of the troops who allegedly committed uh, 24 murders in Haditha. You have charged, <coughs> the Marine Corps has charged Lieutenant Colonel Shasani, the battalion commander, with a failure to <coughs> adequately investigate and report that offense. How high did these war crimes go? If Colonel Shasani is guilty, is not, are not officers more senior to him, how do you determine where this line is going to be drawn? <coughs> Well, that's a difficult line. First, uh, it has not been drawn at this point. The case still is under investigation. But the two things you have to differentiate in a war crime scenario, as you discuss, are those who committed certain acts, certain crimes, the war crime, and as you use the example, murder, and those who were not involved with that act but may have had something to do in covering it up or failing to report it in a later case. Uh, two different standards in the Marine Corps. We are investigating one with Lieutenant Colonel Chisani. He's had an Article 32, the equivalent of a grand jury hearing. And then the question becomes what senior officers, the amount of information you have <coughs> obviously reduces as you go further up the chain, and what information each of those had and what they did or did not do with that information. But certainly just because an officer, you know, pick a particular billet or position in the chain of command at some level, he may not have had that same degree of knowledge or information that someone on the scene might have had. Mm. Along the same lines, Mr. Casey, a, a question uh, for you. This is from uh, last week's uh, New Yorker magazine, The General's Report by Seymour Hirsch, in which he reports on General Taguba's report, General Taguba being one of the 12 reports that issued as a result of Abu Ghraib. Taguba became to believe, and I quote from the article, that Lieutenant General Sanchez, the Army commander in <clears throat> Iraq, a three-star general, and some of the generals assigned to the military headquarters in Baghdad, had extensive knowledge of the abuse of prisoners in Abu Ghraib, even before Joseph Darby came forward with his CD. Taguba was aware that in the fall of 2003, when much of the abuse took place, Sanchez routinely visited the president prison and witnessed at least one interrogation. According to Sanchez, excuse me, according to Taguba, who investigated, Sanchez knew exactly what was going on. In your view, should higher senior officers be charged with events like Abu Ghraib? Should Sanchez be charged? Mm -hmm. Should uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld? How far would you go? Well, uh, good question. Um, and it is one of the questions that uh, uh, thank you. bedevils the laws of war, um, the question of command responsibility. Uh, who is actually responsible for the actions uh, of the people on the ground uh, other than, than themselves? Um, the rules, frankly, uh, I think are, are pretty clear. Uh, it, uh, uh, those who are immediately involved are responsible. Uh, those who uh, knew about it and failed to take action either to stop or punish it uh, may also be uh, prosecuted. Uh, however, once you start moving up the chain of command to people who uh, did not know uh, and further to people who may not have had a reason to know, I mean, uh, yes, it is also true that, that if the individuals <coughs> are in some way negligent, they haven't been looking, in other words, they've been deliberately not uh, 
uh, uh, trying to know what is going on in the ground. There, there also may be liability uh, imputed. But, uh, but there it ends. I mean, it is, it is uh, not permissible, I, I think, not, not fair either. I don't think the law supports uh, moving up the chain of command simply so you can say you punished all the way up the chain of command. That's, that's arbitrary. Um, and so, you know, whether, you know, did, did General Sanchez know? Well, who, who knows? You know, just because Cy Hirsch says it doesn't mean it's true. Um, but uh, uh, what did he witness? Did he witness people stacking naked Iraqis? I doubt it. Um, uh, did he witness a, a, an aggressive interrogation se session? Perhaps. Uh, was it obvious that that aggressive interrogation session was illegal? I don't think so. Changing course slightly, did you have something, General Finnegan? I, I just wanted to talk about what Jackie had said and, and a little bit about what Mr. Casey said. You're right, I think, Jackie, that there wasn't the sense of outrage in the nation that I would have expected at Abu Ghraib. I will tell you that my experience is within the military, if I wouldn't call it a sense of outrage, I'd certainly call it a sense of dismay and a sense of betrayal by other members of the military that something like this was going on, that it is not something that we aspire to as a military that we want to happen. We see ourselves as protectors of freedom and protectors of the, of the rights of people and to think that other soldiers were involved in either those acts or in condoning those acts is something that is just abhorrent. Well, that's the unfortunate part is because it's staying the whole military exactly. for these few people. Yeah, absolutely. And you talked also, I think you're right, that the reason there wasn't a sense of outrage is because of the horrific acts of 9-11. And there's no doubt about it that this enemy, they are horrible people. They are, they are, they have done terrible things and they don't care about innocent victims. And we have, we have reacted to that sometimes. And I think sometimes to our detriment, we have reacted to that. And, it, and some of the things that have come about since 9-11 are because of our reaction to that. And I'll just give you two other examples. And the reaction, the immediate reaction to 9-11 and the thought that these are bad people and we're going to do whatever we have to do to these bad people. One is that two months afterwards, the president signed a military order establishing military commissions without apparently the, the regular staffing that such a thing would occur. And I certainly will guarantee you, without the input of the people who would know most about that, and that's the senior military lawyers in the government who would have objected to it in a number of ways. And we've seen the, the, the terrible effect that that military commission's orders had. We have not really had, with the exception of David Hicks, any trials by military commissions. Oh, again, we've lost all kinds of international goodwill because of that. We have, we have hurt ourselves as a nation by doing that. Another thing that happened immediately after 9-11, <clears throat> about that same time, which has had an effect certainly on Guantanamo as well, was a decision made at the highest levels of government, uh, certainly a, just a decree, that these detainees were not prisoners of war and had no status to being a prisoner of war. To me, it's a mistake to do it that way because what you really wanted from these people was intelligence. You wanted to know what they, what they wanted to know. There's a thing in the Geneva Conventions called an Article 5 hearing. When you don't know if someone is a prisoner of war, you don't know if they're entitled to that status, you have an Article 5 hearing. It's a very simple hearing. We conducted 90,000 of them in the Gulf War. You bring the person in, you say, we don't know if you are eligible to be a prisoner of war. Better status to be a prisoner of war. We don't know if you are. But tell us some things about yourself, and we can determine if you're a prisoner of war. There's almost no cost to those Article 5 hearings. You probably would have gotten some intelligence from those people. And at the end of the day, when they're not eligible for prisoner of war status, you say, well, thanks for the information. You're not eligible. And we're going to detain you. And we, I, think, I, think, I think it's not torture to go back to the, one of the central questions here. It's not torture to detain them indefinitely if we've established that they're a member of some kind of quasi-military force who's fought against us. They're, if they're not under the status of a prisoner of war, they're akin to one. And we hold them until the end of the conflict. And if the end of the conflict is 50 years from now, that's what we do. 
Mm. Well, we have a couple of minutes before we ask for questions from the audience. One last question briefly. I'd like to ask General Finnegan and General Walker. Uh, you've both had billets outside the legal community. How realistic is it to interpret the Geneva Convention, the third Geneva Convention requirement in regard to prisoners of war saying no physical or mental torture nor any other form of coercion may be inflicted on prisoners of war to secure from them information of any kind. Prisoners of war who refuse to answer may not be threatened, insulted, or exposed to any unpleasant or disadvantageous treatment, which Mr. Casey referred to. Or if you're a civilian, protected persons in the Fourth Geneva Convention are entitled to respect for their persons, honor, family rights, religious convictions and practices, and their manners and customs shall at all times be humanely treat, treated and protected, especially against all acts of violence or threats thereof. Is it realistic for soldiers on the ground in Iraq, Marines on the ground in Iraq, who've been patrolling for days in 120 degree heat, humping an 80 pound pack, being shot at every day, to not provide any advantageous, disadvantageous questioning to prisoners? Well, the way you stated it, no, of course. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, the Geneva Convention was not addressing in those aspects the immediate battlefield apprehension in a time of war on the field under fire. It was addressing the conduct in treating prisoners of wars in a detainment setting, in a facility, somewhere back from the front. So, no, it's not realistic in that setting, but re what you have to, again, look at in some of this is that we've talked on almost every topic today, uh, some famous person said, you know, how do you define is? Uh, and that's kind of what we're trying to do here today. In the language there in the Geneva Convention, how do you define torture? We can all agree probably more or so on the definition of torture. Now you get to the other terms used, coercion, and some of the other words, uh, you know, it's coercive in a lot of settings. What is that and how we would define it? We don't have that exact answer, but I think it is realistic for all our military members to set a standard in the rules. You'll never have 100% compliance, but you will have largely adherence to that standard and that rule, and that's a good thing. General Finnegan, do you have anything to answer? Uh, just to, to echo what Jim said at the end there is, one of the advantages that we've had over the years is that we, when we train and educate our soldiers about this is that we have bright line rules. We say here's what you can do and here's what you can't do. And we have fuzzed them up a little bit over the last couple of years and that's led to some problems at Abu Ghraib and other places like that. But he, I think it would be pretty unrealistic to tell a soldier that you can't insult a prisoner. <laughs> Who's insulting you? That's right. Before we turn to questions from the audience, uh, Mr. Casey, do you have anything you'd like to answer? Um, well, only that I, I mean, I, you know, I agree with that. The problem is that is what the, the treaty says. I mean, uh, the Attorney General, now the Attorney General, then White House Counsel, took a lot of grief for, for saying that the Geneva Conventions were. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm uh, used to having the mic. Uh, um, I took a lot of grief for, for, for terming the Geneva Conventions as quaint. Um, but I, I think, and, and while they are, they are extremely important, uh, because we may someday find ourselves in a war where, uh, uh, where our enemy complies with them and they may benefit our people, um, they are quaint. Uh, these treaties were drafted on the assumption that the conflict to which they apply would be the type of conflict characteristic of the period approximately 1870 to 1970, mass conscript armies full of, you know, young men who once they were captured would be just so grateful that they would survive, that they uh, would not be a serious security threat. And so as a result, they're in fact to be treated pretty much like they're, they're at camp. Uh, uh, they are to be given entertainment, sports equipment, musical equipment. They are to govern themselves. Uh, th there are, all of this is, is, is very much applicable to, uh, the, the military ranks are respected. You know, the, it, it's uh, uh, very much applicable to the kind of threat, the kind of, uh, of, of situation they were dealing with in 1949 when these treaties were adopted. They really don't work, it seems to me, very well when you're dealing with 
uh, a force of individuals who are motivated not by uh, uh, devotion to, to, to country and, and, and grateful that, that they're not going to end up in a trench, dead in a trench somewhere, but uh, who uh, are, are religiously motivated and, in fact, believe that if they, you know, some of them at least, <coughs> if they are killed in the, the conflict, they will be rewarded for, for what they have done. I mean, it, we are putting a square peg into a round hole here. Uh, and so, to the extent there has been reinterpretation, um, and, and I would contest how much there really has been, but, but I think we really do need to look at these rules to see how well they apply uh, to the threat that we now face. I think the only problem I have with that is there's some validity, I, I think, in, in what you say, but the problem if you look at something like Guantanamo is, is that we've let hundreds go who have been considered not to be a threat. We never say not right. a threat. We always say no longer because to say not a threat right. would imply that we made a mistake. But so we put all these people through these aggressive interrogations to what end? I mean, if they were not, I mean, that's, well, that is, shouldn't that be that you get the Article 5 hearing, which is right. much more benign? Oh, I, well, as to Article 5, I, I would actually agree with you on Article 5. I am not sure, There's I one. mean, th <laughs> there, there seems to, if, why the administration decided uh, against going through the Article 5 process, I'm not sure, because in fact, it's, it's a pretty minimal, as I understand, a pretty minimal process. and, and uh, and, and could have been done, even if done under a statement that, well, it, legally we're not required to do this, we're going to do it anyway. But as to, you know, the people who have been let go, I mean, you're, you're between a rock and a hard place, obviously. Uh, you either hold people who you've concluded uh, are, are no, no longer need to be, be held, or you let them go and have people say, well, why did you ever hold them in the first place? Maybe there were mistakes. I'm sure there were mistakes. Holding I mean, is one thing, um, though, but in, in, in aggressive well, interrogations is quite another. Are we sure that they were all subject to aggressive interrogations? No, we're not. I mean, you know, it's That's sort of like problem. how many, well, yes, and of course, obviously, from a journalistic perspective and even from an editorialist perspective, uh, it's always good to know what's, what's going on. But in the middle of a war, um, uh, you can't really. Uh, have that kind of, of accessibility since everything we know, the enemy knows. I mean, so it, 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 it puts us at a, a grave dis, disadvantage. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, yes, the, these are real problems, but uh, when you, I, I think you have to strike the balance keeping in mind what we're up against. Excuse me. Uh, so we'll have time left for questions. General Finnegan, the final word. Let me just say one thing about the, the quaintness of the Geneva Conventions. As the, the famous quote from the opinion. There are provisions in there that are quaint, certainly so, and they, they were designed to fit some of the abuses that happened in World War II prison and war camps. But there are also ways, I'd say two things. One, the main provisions of the Geneva Conventions are not quaint, and that is humane treatment. Humane treatment for those who are hors de combat, whether they are prisoners, whether they are civilian detainees, humane treatment. And there are provision, there are ways to work around those quaint provisions, if you will. And I'll give you one example from the Gulf War. One of the things that happened, one of the things that the Geneva Conventions say is that every there must be a canteen in their prisoner of war camp, and you, prisoners get paid so that they can go buy sundries and buy soap and things like that. That's part of the Geneva Conventions. We captured 90,000 Iraqis in the Gulf War, and we didn't have time or the way to do that. So what we did as a nation, as an army, was provided, rather than money and canteens, we provided sundry packs with those things to those prisoners. And we talked to the International Committee of the Red Cross and said, we know this isn't exactly what the conventions say, but aren't we doing what the intent is? And they said, yes, that's fine. You're complying, in a sense, with those conventions. So. Do we have to send them musical instruments? No, I don't think so. I think that that's a quaint provision, but there are ways that you, and you bring the International Committee of the Red Cross who oversees this scheme in, and they tell you, yes, you are complying with the spirit of those conventions. Gentlemen, ladies, if you have any questions, and if it takes more than 60 seconds to state your question, it isn't a question. <laughs> I really enjoyed, and I couldn't agree with you, um, Brigadier General Finnegan, uh, more that uh, Article 5 should have been followed, and that even if the Geneva Convention do not apply regarding most even, or all of the detainees, then the spirit of the Geneva Convention should have been followed. 
As you mentioned, the Israeli Supreme Court uh, held that torture should not be, is, is illegal. This is not because of the utility or the lack of utility of torture. It is not even because of the lack of reciprocity that is uh, not expected. Uh, the Supreme Court in that decision held that it is because of the slippery slope of behavior such as that that is uh, illegal. In that case, that also involved uh, false testimonies uh, on the side of uh, secret uh, agents of, of um, the Israeli authorities. So for these reasons, I think it, may, it would only make sense to follow them. Now, you, you also mentioned, uh, Jackie, if I'm <laughs> uh, the, the issue of whether incarceration or detainment without any limit is a torture in itself. Um, the, under the Geneva Convention, uh, holding of POW is until the cessation of hostilities. Maybe that, as you suggested, should also apply in, in some way uh, to cessation of hostilities uh, for those who are not in, uh, recognized as POWs, but still are involved in a, a, a war that is not defined yet by the current international law. Well, I think that's the exact difficulty we face here. When is the, in the global war on terror, when is the cessation of hostilities? We certainly don't expect a treaty to be signed on an aircraft carrier. Uh, we don't expect a ceremony like that. So when would be the, and that's the difficulty with your point, is we don't know yet how we would define cessation of hostilities. We have another question, sir. Uh, my name is Ed Horak. Uh, my question is, uh, regarding the value of intelligence obtained under aggressive interrogation. Uh, someone's being waterboarded or something like that. Aren't they going to tell you pretty much anything you want? Where's the value? And does any, is any, anyone, can, can anyone tell me where we've had a lot of value from these uh, interrogations? I think that that's an issue that we uh, were discussing, uh, unfortunately, before you arrived oh, okay. here, I'm sorry. About, I came about the quality of <laughs> intelligence, uh, the fact that it's undependable at best, and as General Finnegan pointed out, it simply doesn't work. Uh, Can I respond? <laughs> certainly. Um, I mean, I think uh, we don't really know. Um, word on the street, at least, it suggests that, uh, that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the number two, number three in Al-Qaeda, was waterboarded, uh, and that they got a lot of intelligence from him. Now, I don't know. I wasn't there. but. Uh, um, uh, it, it does seem to me that, you know, someone is obviously going to tell you, uh, and, and by the way, I think, I think waterboarding is torture. I mean, I, I, I understand the Absolutely. argument why it isn't, but it, it's just a little too close to one of the oldies but goodies, which would just stick the guy's head in a bucket until he talks. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, whether, uh, whether it was justified based on his position, I think, is, a, is an, arguable, uh, an arguable point. But, uh, but at least there is some <coughs> suggestion that we did get actionable intelligence. Now, you know, people deny that. We'll never really know because we're not there. I remember he actually admitted to just about everything, didn't he, uh, uh, when he came up? Uh, he may have been CSI guilty of just about like everything. everything. Uh, <laughs> he seemed to take pride in admitting everything. Yes, I am your enemy, and yes, I do want to kill you. He said it all in yeah. his sworn statement. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Sir. Uh, I'm a little bit late, but uh, it seems to me the, exec uh, the executive branch, are they talking about when Guantanamo emptied out that they would send some of the detainees either to their home country or near there, provided these countries kept them incarcerated but in humane condition? Well, that's been a big problem right now. Um, at the moment, there are 80 detainees in Guantanamo who are cleared not for release but for transfer, the, uh, the transfer meaning that they continue to be monitored or held. They can't get rid of those detainees. Yeah. The, but, their countries don't want them back. And my other question was then, have they had any due process to say how long they should be detained even in these other countries? No. No, because the other countries don't want don't them. Don't want them. We've or given them <laughs> some due process to say, you can be yeah. released from our custody, right. but the country country doesn't want them back in part because they may be terrorists. They may be, if they put them in their prison, there might be a terrorist attack in their country in an attempt to free them from the prison. Right. They don't want them back. Right. Mr. Fisher? Yeah, a question for General Walker. You, in your introductory remarks, said we don't torture. The President has said that, Attorney General and others. 
To give that meaning, I mean, it doesn't have any meaning to me. To give that meaning, has the administration said we don't torture and by that we mean, and then you list 20, 30 things that these are things we don't do because that would be torture. Has the list been put together like that? Uh, not exactly in that form. While they have said we don't torture, the only, the closest thing to a list would be the Army Field Interrogation Manual, which has been revised and lists certain techniques which I'm not handed, <laughs> uh, which lists the certain techniques which are approved. Or disapproved. And they, they include those things which you might expect. Waterboarding is specifically mentioned. Hooding, oddly enough, or surprisingly enough, is mentioned. And uh, obviously the, the usual uh, uh, typical torture, severe pain, and so forth. Actually, when I was doing a lot of stuff on Abu Ghraib, I remember Gary, I went through this thing, what is torture and what is not, and Gary sort of suggested, I remember the actuality from him, he just said, you can't run down a list, you can't make up a list of what is torture, specifically what is torture, because then people could just do something else that does not appear on the list. I mean, there's a million things you can do to people to hurt them and to torture them, but I remember you actually saying that you don't want a precise list of what is torture. You want it a little bit vague. I think it's like pornography. You know it when you see it, right? <laughs> that was it, yeah. Uh, this is a come on your back too. This is a question <coughs> for uh, General Finnegan and General Walker, I guess, but anybody can, can answer it. Uh, uh, General Finnegan, you, you, you said that uh, it, it's good uh, to have a bright line, a standard, what you can do, what you can't do, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Uh, in 2005, the president in the signing statement, uh, you know, in, in the enactment uh, which says we don't torture, uh, said he will uh, interpret that in a way consistent with uh, his position as the chief executive. Now, both of you are or have been operational legal advisors. Uh, if the military policeman who's charged with carrying out the orders uh, uh, to investigate and, and, and then to question, uh, would question perhaps whether or not uh, the, uh, uh, the technique might or might not constitute torture. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's not the commander in chief who's going to determine his guilt or innocence, but rather a trier of fact. Uh, as operational legal advisors, what do you tell these investigators and what do you tell operational field commanders? Well, I think that the signing statement <coughs> which I disagree with anyway because I think he doesn't have the authority under international law to define torture separately. Uh, but I think he, he really means, and I think, I trust that the administration means that they want to reserve some of those techniques, principally to CIA interrogators. Because it's not the military interrogators who want to do these kinds of things. And as, a, as an operational legal advisor, I'd follow the Army manual here and I would not allow any military policeman or police officer to do anything beyond what's permitted there. Well, I think the other thing we always <coughs> consider as operational advisors is this the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which makes it a crime to mistreat prisoners, makes it a crime to commit assaults. And so some of these other techniques uh, would be, <coughs> the military member was carrying out those, could be in violation of the UCMJ, and that was something that we repeatedly raised as well. Gentlemen, ladies, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, one, more. one more question. Uh, all right. <laughs> aye, aye, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Question for General Finnegan. Given, uh, sir, that you're the closest to the future military leaders, and the cadets at West Point increasingly will be from a post-2001 world where they don't know what was before that. How do you teach what would be considered correct behavior, given that today they come from a world with all the events we've talked about, plus the television show 24? How do you reestablish <laughs> that goal? Thank you. We use his program. <laughs> Actually, Gary Solis helped set up the Law of War program at West Point, and, and we, we have an extensive Law of War program that's both uh, classroom education and practical exercises in the field so that when uh, young cadets go out on field training, we have teenagers who throw rocks at them. They're really tennis balls, but they look like rocks, and we have them do that and, and have them react to different scenarios out in the field to, and then talk to them again afterwards about what, what can be done. We also talk about Abu Ghraib. We talk about Guantanamo. We have a 
there's there's no one law of work course other than an elective that some cadets can take, but all cadets get instructions in the law of war uh, during military field training, and then again actually in a philosophy course that talks about just war theory. They have a couple sessions on the law of war that Professor Solis still graciously comes up and helps us teach, and then we talk about it again when they're uh, juniors and seniors as they're about to go back, about to go out into the army. We have instruction for them in their military science classes about this using scenario driven exercises. We show them scenes from Black Hawk Down and we show them other things that talk about the application, the use of force and the treatment of prisoners. Gentlemen, ladies, thank you very much. General Patrick Finnegan, Mr. Lee Casey, Ms. Jackie Northam, General Jim Walker, thanks very much for your help. On behalf of uh, Dr. Medina, the Law Librarian of Congress, I could think of no better way to inaugurate our new media center. I think we've captured lightning in a bottle today. If it were up to me and your schedules, we, we could do this for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I know I share everybody uh, everybody's opinion about the, the, the value of today's discussion. Uh, and as citizens, I think it's important that, uh, that we carefully consider all aspects of, of this and, and similar issues. Uh, we, we didn't pay you, of course, but, but we do thank you for we were coming. We're going to talk to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and please accept as a token of our esteem uh, the, an illustrated guide to the collections of the Law Library of Congress. Uh, and uh, we hope we can do something uh, equally as good, although it's going to be difficult. Uh, and, and Lou is the chairman of the, uh, of the committee to, uh, to put together these. Uh, you, you have your work cut out for you. So again, please uh, help me thank the panel again for their time. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.